All right, you ready for the word? Okay, we, keep, we don't have time to review uh, last week, so if you were not here, I hope you would get the CD, because we said a lot then that will help you understand what we're saying today. Uh, but we're talking about being in the kingdom, and of course, it's our year of dominion, and learning how to exercise dominion uh, in our lives, uh, how to establish God's will, God's perfect will in our lives. Jesus said, we should pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Meaning God has a will for your life, for my life. He has a will for us together. He has a will for this world. And, and we want to see God's will established. We have to exercise dominion. And so we're learning how to do that, what it takes to exercise dominion so that we experience God's perfect will. Now, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, when Jesus began to preach about the kingdom... The first thing he said to, to people who were listening, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Say that. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, you've been living your life and, and you've grown up uh, in this culture, in this world system, and you've learned to think a certain way and to behave a certain way because that's based upon your thoughts. Now I'm announcing to you that the kingdom of God is present and it's available and you can enter into this kingdom and you can begin to live in this kingdom and begin to experience the benefits of being a kingdom citizen of having Jesus as your king. The Bible says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. You can come into this kingdom and you can literally begin to walk in and experience righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost as a way of life. The Father says uh, that he will supply all our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So we shouldn't have to worry or be anxious about our needs because our Heavenly Father knows the things we have needed. So Jesus says, seek first the kingdom and all of these things will be added to you. There are just so many blessings that await us in the kingdom of God. But of course, you can't participate or partake of any of them unless first you enter the kingdom. Amen? So, but how do you enter the kingdom? Jesus says to enter the kingdom requires repentance. Now, we told you last week that to repent is to, is to rethink. All right? It is to change what you're thinking concerning a particular thing. But to change your thinking to such a degree that it changes your behavior. All right? So to enter the kingdom, if you're not in the kingdom and you want to enter the kingdom, you got to repent. In other words, you've got to do what? Rethink your position on salvation. If all your life you thought that to be saved required good works and uh, is based upon your own righteousness, in, in order to enter the kingdom, you got to rethink your position concerning how to be saved. You're saved by grace. Rethink your position concerning Jesus and, be, and that he's a savior, not just a prophet. All right? So you got to rethink your position to the degree that you now act upon it in declaring Jesus Christ your Savior and your Lord. When you rethink or repent to the degree that it changes your behavior towards Jesus, you can enter the kingdom. All right? Now, once you enter the kingdom, everything in the kingdom is there for you and me. But repentance is not just for entering the kingdom. Repentance is for living in the kingdom because in order to enjoy kingdom benefits and, and all of your rights as kingdom citizens, you've got to change the way you think about who you are, the way you think about who God is. If you've been a beggar all your life and your rich uncle dies and puts a million dollars in your bank and somebody comes and tells you you're no longer a beggar, you are a, a, a millionaire, but you say, no, I don't believe that I'm still a beggar. I don't believe that I have a million dollars. Who, who, what rich uncle do I have that would die for me and put a million dollars in the bank? Well, you got a million dollars in the bank, right? But you're going to still live like a beggar. Not because you don't have a million dollars, but because you didn't renew your mind. You had to stop thinking of yourself as a beggar and start thinking of yourself now as a millionaire so you can start enjoying the million dollars that's in the bank. You follow me? So all of these things that God has put in his kingdom and made available to us as kingdom citizens are ours. But in order to partake of them, we've got to renew our minds so that we begin to align our thoughts with what God says concerning us and what God says concerning the kingdom. Otherwise, we'll be kingdom citizens, we'll be princes, we'll be ambassadors of the kingdom, we'll be subordinate kings under the king of kings and still living as though we're not in the kingdom. 
Many believers today are living as though they're not in the kingdom. That's why you worry. That's why you fear. You're afraid. That's why you're anxious. That's why you do stuff that you shouldn't do. Because your mind has not been renewed and you have not aligned your thoughts with what God has to say. All right? So it's very, very important then that we right, go through this process of rethinking, repenting, renewing our minds so we can experience God's perfect will for us in Christ in the kingdom. So in Romans chapter 12, we're told in verse 2 to do what? Don't be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind as repentance so that you can experience God's perfect will. I told you last week, whoever controls your thoughts will control your emotions. Whoever controls your emotions will control your behavior. Whoever controls your behavior is going to have a large influence on what you experience in life and what the outcomes are that you um, walk in. So because the thought life affects your emotional life and also your behavior, the focus, the primary focus of the devil is your head. He wants to get inside your head and control your thoughts. God's focus also now is to get into your head as well. Because God wants to work through you, but God cannot work through you and work for you as he desires until he can begin to influence the way you think. All right? So now that we're saved, and most of us here already are, we need now to be engaged in this process of repenting. That is, renewing our mind, replacing our old way of thinking with God's thoughts concerning us, concerning himself, concerning the kingdom. And if we can align our thoughts with God's thoughts concerning us, the kingdom, guess what? We will start to walk in God's will in every area more and more. All right? So, where's the focus of spiritual warfare? The primary focus of spiritual warfare is in the mind. The ground that Satan wants to gain is in your head. All right? So, with that in mind, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And uh, we're going to look at verse 3 through 5. Because... This is where most of your spiritual warfare is going to take place. And so you need to realize that and you need to learn what you need to do in order not to give the enemy a place in your life. So let's read this and then I'm going to comment on, the mess, on this, these verses as we read. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So we walk in the flesh simply means you're a human being. You look at yourself, you are a physical being. You have a physical body. You eat, you drink, you sleep. You do all the things that are necessary for your body to be able to live. So we walk in the flesh. But he says, we do not war according to the flesh, okay? What this means is that there is a war taking place, and we need to realize that. There's a war taking place, and that war is over the souls, the minds, the hearts of men and women. Nations fight wars, and they want to gain physical ground and physical territory so they can control what happens in that territory. In the realm of the spirit, the battle is to get a hold of your, of your, of your mind. The, the, the battle is to uh, uh, be able to control your mind, your will. Ultimately, what, what the enemy wants, of course, is to destroy you forever if he can. His, his goal is to see that, that as many people as possible go to hell that he possibly can take with him. But as in the case of many of you, he's lost that battle already because you're born again. You believed in Jesus. You're saved. Say hallelujah. So you ain't going to spend any time in hell. Thank God for Jesus. But since you're not going to go to hell, he wants to bring hell to you. I was going to spin this over and what do you do? You drop it. What, what do you do with the mic, you? But this is too expensive. I'm not going <laughs> to. Amen. But, but that's a good point. I don't want you to miss that. You're already born again. Thank God you're in the kingdom. You're not going to hell. You're not going to spend one second in hell if you're in Christ Jesus. Say hallelujah. Your spirit has been delivered. You've been sealed with the blood of Jesus. And as long as you're in Christ, you're not going to hell. So you keep trusting Jesus as your savior. You're okay. Amen. Don't throw away your faith in Jesus. Keep trusting Jesus as your Savior, and you are okay. All right? But even though you're not going to hell, there's enough hell down here on earth 
that the devil can do everything he can, okay? So he wants you to experience as much hell as you can on earth. But for him to do that, he's going to have to be able to get into your mind to control your thoughts and your emotions and your behavior and your reactions to things that happen around you. Okay? As I said last week, you can't stop everything that's happening out there, but you can, you can decide how you're going to respond to what happens out there. And it's your response to whatever happens that determines whether your experience is hell or not. You follow me? It's painful, but it doesn't have to be hell. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. That is a fact. Because the world has fallen. But then he says, be of good cheer. Because what? I have overcome the world. So even in the midst of tribulation, you can be an overcomer. But it depends on what's happening in your head. All right? Again, God wants you to walk in righteousness, peace, and joy, and power by the Holy Spirit. That can be your experience and my experience. But a lot of that depends on what I allow into my mind. All right? So there's a battle taking place. There is a war taking place. The location of that war is in the mind. Okay? Now, we are, we are to fight that war, but we're not to do it according to the flesh. In other words, don't try to win spiritual battles using fleshly weapons. Okay? Because you're going to lose. And even any victory you think you win using fleshly weapons are only apparent victories. Ultimately, God is not glorified by that. So when you're dealing with enemies that are seeking to destroy your, your life, spiritual enemies, you've got to use spiritual weapons. All right? Now, who are the enemies that we deal with? Just like you have a holy trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is an unholy trinity that is against you and me. The world... The flesh and the devil. Say that the world, the flesh, the devil. An unholy trinity that is fighting you and trying to keep you from experiencing God's will and God's best in the kingdom. The world refers to this world system that is under the control of the prince of darkness. That is against God and against God's purpose. When you go to work tomorrow morning, you need to be mindful. The world system that you are in, you're not of this world, but you got to live in it, is against God and God's will. It looks good. It looks very attractive. It's dressed well. Angel of light. Covered with gold. I hear me very, very attractive to the flesh, but it's designed to keep you out of God's will and to prevent God's will from being done on earth as it is in heaven. So be aware of that. Then there's the flesh. The flesh refers to that part of you in your mind, your will and emotions, that, that part of you that is still opposed to God, that is affected by the fall. That you have to deal with. Is that, is that part of you that doesn't want to do what God says? All right? That wants you to, to, to go where you shouldn't go, say what you shouldn't say. Uh, the, the principle that operates in that part of you is pride. All right? But it's the flesh that you got to deal with as well and overcome. And then there is the devil himself, Satan himself. Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll look at that later, talks about principalities and powers. Ladies and gentlemen, the devil is not a, an imaginary creature. He's not something that you just dream about. He's real. He's a human. He, now he's not a human being, but sometimes he looks like a human being, right? Human beings sometimes look like him, right? I know that. I know you think that person is the devil, but that person isn't the devil. The person just resembles the devil. That's all. They just have a resemblance, but they're not the same. <laughs> no, the devil is is a is a real being, just like you and I are human beings. The devil is a spirit being, just like God is a spirit being. The devil and demons are real creatures. Okay? And they are determined, again, to do everything within their power to steal, kill, and destroy. Ultimately, the goal is to keep you out of heaven altogether. But since they can't do that for most of you now, they're going to do everything else to make life as difficult as possible for you. That is real. 
All right? So we have to deal with those kinds of things, devils in the world and the flesh. And hear me, you're not going to be able to win that war trying to fight in your own strength with your own weapons and willpower. So the good news is, verse 4, we're told in verse 4 that God has done what? Given us weapons. Amen? The weapons of our warfare are not fleshly. They're not natural. But they are what? Say mighty. Say mighty. Say the weapons of my warfare are mighty in God. In other words, they're empowered by God himself. Amen? God has provided weapons for warfare against the world, warfare against the flesh, and warfare as warfare against demons that are empowered by God himself to be able to overcome the world, to be able to overcome the flesh, and to be able to, yes, even overcome the devil. Say, Father, I thank you for these weapons that you've given unto me. All right? And he says that these weapons are mighty for what? Pulling down strongholds. So what are you supposed to do with these weapons? You're supposed to use them to pull down strongholds. Or uh, the other translation says to destroy speculation, to destroy strongholds. Casting down, next verse. How do you do it? Casting down arguments. King James says vain imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What are we supposed to do with these strongholds? First of all, the strongholds are where? They're in the mind. And what are the strongholds made of? They're made of arguments or vain imaginations. They're made of high, exalted, proud thoughts in our minds. All right? And these thoughts and these vain imaginations and these arguments are erected in our minds and they become strongholds. Now, what is a stronghold? Militarily, a stronghold is something that your enemy builds. It's a fortress that is designed to keep you from entering in, from getting into a particular place to take possession of something you want or something you believe you have a right to. All right? So a high fence, a thick wall can be a fortress to keep you out, from, to prevent you from entering in and taking possession of something that you want. So we're told here that the enemy, that is Satan and his demons, are able to build, erect in our minds strongholds. They are mental strongholds because these strongholds in the mind are constructed by the enemy through lies, deceptions, vain imaginations, proud thoughts, and, and reasonings, and arguments that are contrary to the knowledge of God. Now, the devil is defeated, but the devil is still a liar. His nature hasn't changed. Amen? So, as long as he's around, he's going to be able to lie, and he's a master at deceit. He's a master at lies. He, he, the Bible says he's so good at lying, if it were possible, even the elect will be deceived. He's so good at lying that when you see him, you, won't, you would think he's an angel. You would think he's Gabriel. Okay? So he's a master at lying. And, and through lies, lies about God, lies about you, lies about the purpose of life, through lies, lies told to you from the time you were a child, week after week, year after year, through many multiple avenues, the devil is able to keep that lie going. And the more you hear it, you get to a place where you really start to believe the lie and you think the lie is true. And when you believe the lie as though it's true, it becomes a stronghold. And the purpose of that stronghold in your mind is to keep you from entering into the fullness of your inheritance and taking possession of God's promises. All right? So, strongholds, like in the, in, 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 in the natural, like in military warfare, a stronghold is placed in the way of the enemy in order to prevent the enemy from entering in and taking possession. Spiritually, the enemy through lies and deceits can successfully and has to some degree successfully done that in all our lives, erected these mental strongholds. And as long as they are in place, they will limit or block our ability to take possession of what God has given us in the kingdom. Right? So when you got a stronghold 
that is standing in the way and preventing you from possessing what God has given you. What needs to happen in that stronghold? It needs to come down. It needs to be demolished. It needs to be destroyed. So in the name of Jesus, every stronghold in your mind needs to come down. Every stronghold in my mind, every vain imagination needs to be destroyed. Every proud thought in my mind that is opposed to God needs to come down. Every pattern of reasoning that is contrary to the knowledge of God, the truth of God, needs to be destroyed. Because if I allow them to stay in place, they limit severely my ability to enter in and take possession of and to experience what the kingdom of God has for me. Amen? If I'm going to walk in righteousness, walk in peace, experience the joy of the Holy Spirit, I've got to see those strongholds coming down. All right? So, let me give you some examples. If the enemy, for instance, has been able through his lies to successfully plant in your mind a stronghold of doubt concerning God's willingness and God's ability to heal you, over the years, for whatever reason, maybe you've seen people die who you prayed for. You have, you know, and some certain things have been there for so long. Whatever the reason, if he over a period of time can convince you that you know what, it's not God's will or God is not able or God's not going to heal me, that becomes a stronghold in your mind. And as long as that stronghold is there, it's going to severely limit, if not prevent you from being able to appropriate healing, even though God says it's the children's bread. You follow me? So if a stronghold of doubt is in your mind concerning God's willingness and ability to heal, that stronghold needs to come down so that you can experience God as your healer. Right? Let's say he successfully planted in your mind a stronghold of doubt concerning God's willingness and ability to supply all your needs. I mean, to meet your needs. Now, God has promised he will. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply what? All your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That's a promise. Amen. Matthew 6.33, Jesus said, You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what's going to happen? All things will be added to you. Amen. In Paul's letter to Corinthians, he says, God is able to make all grace abound towards you. So that you always have it in abundance for every good deed. You find more than enough. So it, the promises that God will provide and supply our needs are numerous. But if the enemy successfully plants in your mind and, and erects in your mind a stronghold of doubt concerning God's willingness and ability to supply your needs, you know what, what's going to happen? You're going to live your life worrying, being fretful, being anxious about material things. And as a result, a, a kingdom citizen, you won't have peace, you won't experience joy. Amen? Because you'll constantly be worrying about how will my needs be met? How will my bills be paid? Where is this going to come from? And so because of the stronghold of doubt, you don't experience that peace, that joy that comes from knowing that your heavenly father knows the things you have need of and he is supplying your needs. Huh? As long as that stronghold of doubt is in your mind concerning God's ability and willingness to supply your need, you're going to find yourself unable to be generous. Amen? Because you're always going to feel, I'm not going to have enough. I can't afford to do this. I can't afford to do that. And then you cheat yourself of the blessing of generosity. And there are blessings associated with being generous. Emotional blessings, spiritual blessings, even physical blessings. There are many blessings associated with just being a generous person. But because of the stronghold in your mind, that stronghold of doubt, that causes you to doubt whether God will take care of you, you don't enter into that experience as a kingdom citizen. Are you, are you following me? Uh, another area that he might plan a stronghold of doubt in your mind might be concerning God's love for you. How many people in the kingdom don't really, 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 really believe God loves them unconditionally? Don't. They think that they have to do something to earn or merit God's love. And the more they do the thing, the more God loves them, the less they do, the less God loves them. Amen? They can't accept the fact that God has forgiven them of all of their sins, past, present, and future, that you are a totally forgiven person. And as long as that is in your mind, that stronghold of doubt concerning God's love for you, concerning the degree to which God has totally, completely forgiven you in Christ Jesus, you're not going to experience freedom from guilt. 
like you should. You're not going to experience freedom from condemnation. You're going to find yourself struggling to believe God when you pray that God has hurt you because you're tying the answer to your prayers to your performance. So you will struggle with faith and therefore undermine your own prayers. So the devil can get me to doubt a stronghold in my mind that causes me to doubt God's unconditional love and total forgiveness for me. What happens? I'm not able to pray with confidence anymore. Therefore, I limit what I can receive from God through prayer. By faith. I, and I could go on and on with many examples. But the point is, that is why the enemy focuses so much on our minds. Because he knows if he can get the strongholds of doubts there, he can stop so many things from happening in our lives. And that is why God also focuses on our minds because he wants us to replace those wrong ways of thinking concerning him, those lies that have been told concerning him and concerning you, concerning his purpose. He wants us to replace that with the truth that will set us free. God wants those strongholds to come down. And that's why he tells us, cast it down your arguments and bring every thought captive to what? Bring every thought into captivity to what? Bring every thought into captivity to what? Now, let me tell you what that means. It means bring every thought into alignment with what Jesus accomplished through his obedience for you. Uh, that, that, that was weak, so let me try you all. Amen. What he's saying here is, this is what you and I need to do. We need to bring every thought in our mind into alignment. You take those thoughts captives that are out of alignment, not in agreement with what Jesus accomplished for you on the cross through his obedience. So any thought in my mind that is out of sync and not in alignment with what Jesus accomplished for me through his obedience on the cross has the potential to become a stronghold in my life and to limit my experience of God's blessings. So in spiritual warfare, I want to be alert, aware, and when the Holy Spirit shows me a thought that is not in alignment with what Christ accomplished for me through his obedience, what am I supposed to do? Take it captive. In other words, I am to reject it and to replace it with the truth. Amen. Amen. So, so if a thought comes to your mind and says, you know what, uh, God is angry with you right now, God's not going to hear your prayer because of that thing you did. Well... What did Jesus accomplish by his obedience? He paid for my sins completely. And as a result of what Jesus did, God is not charging me with my sins anymore. I'm forgiven. You know what? Yeah, I've sinned. That's wrong. But I'm a forgiven person. God's still going to hear me. Are you hearing me? We got to take every thought and bring it into captivity. Now, it takes faith to do that. It doesn't take faith to see yourself as a sinner. It takes faith for you who know you sin to see yourself as forgiven and righteous and holy and blameless. And we're called to walk by faith. In another place, Timothy said, let's, uh, Paul said to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Am I communicating? Yes. Are you receiving? Yes. All right. So where is the focus of your spiritual warfare? It's your, amen? And what is the enemy trying to do? Erect strongholds of doubt in your mind by sowing seeds of lies concerning God, concerning you, concerning Jesus, concerning God's love for you, all of those things that are contrary to the knowledge of God. If we allow those thoughts to stay in place, they can become so strong and control us so much that we're unable to receive the promises of God in that area. So we want to be vigilant in taking them captive and bringing them into agreement with everything Jesus did for us and accomplished through his obedience on the cross. I hear him? All right. So then, he referred to weapons. Say weapons. Okay, so what are the weapons that God has given us that are empowered by him to overcome the world, overcome the flesh, overcome the devil, to destroy strongholds and to bring our thoughts in alignment with, with Christ. Go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse, eight, verse 10. Ephesians 6, 10. Let's read together. 
Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and what? I like that. I like that. You know what? Say to your neighbor, you don't have to be strong. Don't even try to be strong. Just let the Lord be your strength. Oh, you didn't hear me? Amen. The Lord is the strength of my life. I, I'm okay. In fact, God said to Paul, Paul, when, you, when you're weak, when you admit that you are powerless, that's when you're strong. Because when you can admit you don't have strength, then you can let God be your strength. The problem is all of us, many of us are trying to be strong in ourselves. And beating ourselves up because we discover we're not strong enough. Let me let you know you'll never be strong enough in yourself to deal with the world, the flesh, and the devil. So don't even try. The world and the flesh and the devil are too strong for you. But the good news is you don't have to be strong. Just let the Lord be your strength. Now when the Lord is your strength, you are strong. I wish I had a glove here because if I had a glove here, I would, I would, I would, I would. I would illustrate about you everybody knows a glove right a, a glove is a very weak and powerless thing right that's you but when I put my hand in the glove that glove takes all my strength and everything this strong and powerful man can do anything that's strong and say strong and powerful <laughs> this strong and powerful man can lift. All of a sudden, that glove can lift. The glove has become as strong as the hand that is in it. You see, when the hand is the strength of the glove, the glove is strong. But without the hand, the glove is totally weak. Without Jesus, you, are, you can do nothing. But when Jesus is your strength, then you are as strong as Jesus. And anything Jesus can do, all of a sudden, can be done through you because you are strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Say, the Lord is my strength. I can do all things through Christ who is strengthening me. Jesus is the hand in the glove. So stop trying to be strong. That's like a glove trying to be strong. You weren't made to be strong. You were made to contain the one who is strong. Oh, I'm preaching better than you are listening. God never intended you to be strong. Because if you are strong in yourself, you'll say, I don't need God. No, no. We were created to contain the one who is strong. So that's what Paul is saying. He says, when you're dealing with the world of flesh and the devil, what you need is not to try to be strong, but to just acknowledge and recognize that the Lord is your strength and put your trust in him as your strength. All right? All right, next verse. Put on the whole armor of, the armor of who? In other words, the armor belongs to God. You don't have to come with your own armor. There is an armor that belongs to God himself. That's the armor that Jesus wears. <laughs> that armor has been given to you. You know, Saul gave David his armor. It didn't fit. But the armor of God? Amen. God designed it in such a way to fit you in Jesus. So Paul says in spiritual warfare, as you take possession of your possessions, recognizing the opposition of the enemy who's trying to keep you out, you will have to wage war. But here you, here's what you need to do. Don't try to be strong in your own strength. Let the Lord be your strength. By grace you're saved. Let the Lord be your strength. Amen. Acknowledge your weakness, but say, the Lord is my strength. Don't ever say, I'm weak and stop there. If you say, I'm weak, say, but the Lord is my strength. The strength of my life, whom shall I fear? Amen. Say, hallelujah. All right, so now that you're strong because the Lord is your strength, now he's actually telling you how to make the Lord your strength, practically. He says, put on the whole armor of God. Okay, so there's an armor that God gives you, and this armor is so strong and so powerful, the devil, the world, and the flesh are powerless when, against you when the armor is on. No weapon form against you can prosper when the armor is on. The enemy will attack, You'll feel the blows. Even with the armor, you can feel the blow. Amen? But ultimately, no 
weapon formed against you is going to prosper. The enemy will not be able to destroy your life because of the attacks that he brings against you. <laughs> Say, thank God for the armor of God. Now, with this armor, you're going to be able to do what? Stand against the what? Against what? Notice again, whilst those are lies. Paul is again is identifying the chief weapon the enemy uses to try to defeat you and keep you out of your inheritance, to keep you from possessing your possessions. What are they? Wiles, lies, more lies, and yet more lies concerning God, concerning you, concerning Jesus and what he has done, concerning righteousness, concerning salvation, concerning faith, concerning peace. Say lies and more lies. But when you put on the armor, you are going to be to stand against the wiles. In other words, the lies will not work. And if the lies don't work, there can be no stronghold. And there can be no stronghold. He can't keep you from possessing your possessions. Uh, these, these people are not with me, so let me try y'all. Amen? If you got on the armor, the armor is going to protect you. That means the lies of the devil, which he is very good at, but as good as he is at lying, if you have on the armor that God gives you, if you put that armor on, the lies will not work. And if the lies don't work, he can't erect a stronghold, and the lies don't work, he cannot keep you out of your possession. It may be delayed a little bit, but he can't stop you. You may have to wait before it fully manifests, but he can't stop it. Say hallelujah. Verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against what? Powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness. Do you see why you need to be strong in the Lord? <laughs> because you in yourself are no match for principalities and powers. When are you going to be strong enough to deal with them? So don't waste your time. Don't try to be strong in yourself. You just let the Lord be your strength. And the way you allow the Lord to be your strength is by putting on the armor. And when you put on the armor, he says, what, what are you supposed to do? Stand. Some of you who were here last week heard me say, when you're wrestling, you don't, if you just, if you get in a wrestling ring and you just stand, you are, that's not good advice. Because it's going to be so easy for the person who you're wrestling against to knock you down. Right? If you're wrestling, you need to get down. Amen. I don't know how to wrestle, so don't even, don't, don't even look at me and think that I know what I'm doing. But, but, but I've seen enough in the ring that, you know, they, you know I see them going like this. It, it, I guess the lower you go, the harder it is for them to... Is, anybody here know anything about wrestling? But you don't... I never see them in the ring just standing up at the wrestling. The only time they stand up is when the fight is over. <laughs> yeah. They stand up when the victory is already won. Say hallelujah. So what the Lord is saying, watch this. He's saying when you deal with the enemy, you start from the position of victory. In other words, listen to me. You put on the armor so you can stand in the place of one who is already won. You put on the armor so you can act and talk like one who has already conquered. You put on the armor so you can conduct yourself and think like you are more than a conqueror. You put on the armor so you can look at the enemy and laugh at him and say, you're under my feet. Amen. You put on the armor so you can carry yourself like a winner. Amen. But wait a minute. Where did that victory come from? No. This is the point. When you deal with the devil in spiritual warfare, you are not, as I've said, you're not trying to establish your own victory. What you're doing is you are appropriating the victory Jesus has already won. So when you're putting on the armor, what you're really doing is you're appropriating the victory that Christ has already won over the devil, and that's where you're taking your stand. 
The devil wants you to move from that place of victory to try to get it. Don't fall for that lie. As a believer, you don't need to try to get victory. You don't need to fight for victory. No, 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 no. What you do is you appropriate by faith the victory Christ has already won. So the purpose of putting on the armor is so you can stand. The purpose of putting on the armor is because that's how you appropriate the victory Christ has already won from the devil. Amen. And the Bible says when you appropriate the victory Christ has won, that is what resisting him is. And the Bible says he will flee. All right. So let's quickly look at what the pieces of the armor are. Now, I won't have the time to define each of them. Maybe in another message I'll do that. But I just want you to see quickly what the pieces of the armor are. These are the pieces of the armor, spiritual armor, which God has given you and me. And he says, if you will put this on, you will stand against all the wiles of the devil. If you will put this on, you will be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. If you will put this on, no weapon form against you will prosper. If you will put this on, you will be more than a conqueror. If you will put this on, no matter what the devil brings to you, and no matter how hard and difficult the tribulation will be, you will emerge out of that more than a conqueror. You will come out of trouble better than you were before you went in. All things will work together for your good. The plans and purposes will be accomplished by God in spite of what the end enemy is doing. What the enemy means for evil will work for your good. Like Joseph, he may get you the, um, in, in the pit, in prison, but you end up on the throne. Like Jesus, he may get you on the cross, but you're going to end up at the right hand of God and all knee will bow to you. Do, you. do you hear what I'm saying? Ultimately, if you got this armor on, everything God allows the devil to do is going to propel you to your destiny. So, let's begin looking at the pieces of armor. Having your loins what? Girded your waist with what? Truth. So, the first thing in the armor is truth. All right? So, God is saying, you need to be strong in the Lord. In the power of his mind, you need to put on this armor. And the first piece of that armor you need to put on is truth. Say the truth of God. Now, what is the devil's number one strategy? Weapons? Lies. So what do you think is the best defense against lies? But not just any truth. When you see truth there, it's specific. Jesus said, I am the truth. So we're talking about the truth concerning Jesus and his finished work. God says, put that on. The next thing he says you should do what is put on what? The breastplate of righteousness. The devil wants you to feel condemned. And when you're condemned and feeling guilty, you got no faith. So the Lord says, you need to put on righteousness. Now, it's not your righteousness. Remember, the armor is who's God. So every piece of this armor is given to you in Christ by grace. None of the pieces in this armor you work for, earn, or deserve. All the pieces of the armor you appropriate. Remember? You don't fight for, you appropriate what Christ has given you. Jesus did the fighting. He did the battle. He fought and he won. And the Bible says he spoiled principalities and powers. He made an open show of them. God exalted him and, and seated him far about principality. The battle was fought on Calvary and won. When Jesus arose from the dead, it was over for the devil. Say hallelujah. And it was over for his kingdom. He is and he remains today a defeated foe. So all of this is a gift. You don't work for righteousness. You appropriate what Jesus already obtained. He was made sin for you who knew no sin so that you may become what? The righteousness of God in Christ. Next, next piece of the armor. Having your having shod your feet with the preparation of the God spoke now. That word preparation, in other words, you prepare for battle against the devil. How? By putting on or taking on 
or listening to, appropriating the message of the gospel that proclaims Jesus is your peace. Your peace between you and God. Next verse. And above all, take the what? The shield of faith with which you shall do what? Quench how many of the fiery darts of the devil? All the fiery darts of the devil. He says you will quench all the fiery darts of the devil with what? The shield. Now watch this. Every piece of the armor is God's gift to you. So this faith is not your faith. It is his faith given to you by grace. Jesus is the author and the finisher of faith. So you don't have to, so oh, if only I had faith, if only I had faith. No, God has already given you faith. It's a gift. You have it. So the Bible didn't say try to get faith, just take it. Amen. Say, you know, you know, the, 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 I shall not, I don't want to preach another sermon. So let me, I will hold some of this for another time. But again, even faith is a gift. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It, the faith by which you are saved, is a gift from God. So you, don't, you can't even boast about your faith. It's a gift. God has given you the faith that you need to quench all the fire and dust of the devil. Say thank you, Jesus. You are the author and the finisher of the faith by which I quench all the fire and dots of the devil. Say it one more time. Thank you, Jesus. You are the author and you are the finisher of the faith by which right now I quench all the fiery darts of the devil. No weapon formed against me shall prosper because Jesus is the author and the finisher of my faith and this faith that God has given me quenches all the fiery darts of the devil. You said, you said, Bishop, Bishop, don't we need faith? Yeah, you need faith. The faith has been given to you. Yeah. And what is the object of your faith? Listen to this. The faith you have, big or small, whatever you call it, take your faith and put it in the faith of Jesus. Because by his faith, he obtained every blessing for you. So when the devil says to you, I don't have faith, say, yeah, I got faith in the faith of Jesus. You didn't hear me. Devil, I don't, yeah, devil, I don't have faith. My, I don't have, you know, I'm not relying on my faith. I have faith in the faith of Jesus. And I believe that by his faith and by his obedience, you see, I'm bringing every thought captive to what Jesus accomplished by his obedience. I believe by his faith and by his obedience, he obtained my healing. By his faith and his obedience, he already made provision for me in this area. By his faith and his obedience, he already defeated you. By his faith and his obedience, he's already brought me out of this. Devil, I'm not relying on my faith. I'm relying on the faith of the Son of God. That faith that I have received by grace is quenching. Come on, say that. The faith I have received by grace is quenching all the fiery darts of the devil right now. Verse 17, and take what? The helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. Now watch this. Everything else that we've read up to verse 17, the helmet of salvation, are pieces of the armor and they're all defensive. Right? They're defensive weapons. In other words, they protect you. They protect your mind in particular. From the, from the attacks of the enemy, the wilds of the devil, the lies. It's attempt to build strongholds or to maintain strongholds. The armor that we just described protect your mind. Righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, the message of salvation, all of these 
protect your mind. Now, how do you put them on? In the Roman, in the Roman, in the Roman soldier's armor, and the different pieces, Paul, all of these pieces of the armor, Paul was actually looking at a Roman soldier because Paul was in prison when he was saying this stuff. So he was looking at Roman soldiers and actually looking at what they were wearing in order to make a, a metaphor, okay, about the king, the, the, the spiritual armor we are to bear. The, 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 the belts, which in this spiritual is called the belt of truth, but in the Roman soldier army, everything in the, in the, in the armor was connected to the belt, depended upon the belt in some way or the other. And notice, when it comes to our spiritual armor, the first thing you put on is what? Truth. Because everything in the armor depends upon truth. So when Paul says, put on the armor of God, this is what he's saying. Renew your mind with the knowledge of the truth concerning Jesus as your righteousness. That's how you put on the breastplate of righteousness. Renew your mind with the truth, or with the knowledge of the truth, concerning Jesus as your peace between you and God. Renew your mind with the knowledge of the truth concerning Jesus and his salvation. Renew your mind. Just so for instance, I was telling you just now, faith is a gift. Because Jesus is the author and finisher. What have I done? I renewed my mind with the knowledge of faith as a gift. So, the way you put on the armor is to repent, to change the way you're thinking, to renew your mind with the knowledge of the truth concerning each of those things as they are provided for you and given to you by grace in Christ Jesus. So then, if I'm going to renew my mind with knowledge of the truth, where am I going to get the truth from? So you see why the word of God is so critical. Because you cannot put on the armor without the knowledge of the truth. Where do you find the truth? In the word. That's why coming to church, not once a month, but hearing the word, and I keep saying this so you don't listen to sermons once, listen to them over and over again. Get into the word, read the word, hear the word, read the word, hear the word, because that is how you renew your mind with the truth. Now be careful what word you're listening to. Because not every word you hear is the gospel of peace. There's a, there's a so-called gospel of condemnation and wrath and judgment. The devil love would love for you to close yourself with that. Okay? You need to renew your mind with what? The knowledge of the gospel of peace. Every piece of this armor. Find out what Jesus has accomplished for you through his death, burial, resurrection, through his obedience. And start to change the way you think. So that the way you think come into alignment with every piece of this armor as they have been provided for you in Christ by grace. And when you do that, you're clothing yourself with the armor of God. And the enemy will not be able to successfully build and erect strongholds in your mind that limit your, your access to the promises of God in your life. Okay? So those are defensive weapons, but now we look at what? The offensive weapons. There are two offensive weapons. Go back to verse 18. 17, please. He, he says, the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. Alright? So we know now this weapon that you, you use it for defense too, but it also is a weapon that you can use to, to attack. So you clothe yourself in the armor. The devil is not going to run just because you got on the armor. But when you take the sword also, and you add the sword to the armor, then the devil says, oh, oh. This man is not just going to stand and let me attack him. This man is coming after me. <laughs> you follow me? So, so the sword, the thing that enables you now to go on the fence is what? The word of God. And so you need to take the word of God. And what do you put the word of God? You put it in your mind and you put it in your mouth and you put it in your heart and you speak it. 
right? So, so again, we, we, we wanted strongholds to come down. We wanted to possess our possessions. We put on the armor that protects us. But now we go on the offense with the word of God. We put the word of God in our mind. We put the word of God in our heart. And we put the word of God in our mouth. Because when the word is being spoken, that is when it becomes an offensive weapon. Yeah. So every time the devil came to Jesus, Jesus said, it's written, it's written, it's written, it's written, it's written. He was using it both for defense and offense. All right? So again, we got to put the word, word, mind, heart, mouth. All right? But he didn't say just the word. Look at the next verse. Praying always with all prayer. Now, that is also part of the offensive weapon. So you put on the armor that we've described. You take the word of God. And what do you do to go on offense? You begin to take that word and you begin to pray in the spirit. That's how you start to release the power of the word and the power of the spirit. It's by taking the word and then beginning to pray how? In the spirit. Praying in the spirit. Spirit, praying in the Spirit, praying in empowered by the Spirit, but praying in tongues. So let me be real Pentecostal right now. So, you know, we've been trying to be too polite and and and, and decent in this place. So I'm going to be Pentecostal because that's he's talking about Pentecostal prayer. I hear me. He's talking about Holy Ghost empowered prayer. He's talking about praying in tongues. Are you hearing me? You can pray in English too. I'm not saying you don't pray in English, but in addition, pray in tongues. So, so I put on the armor, we just described it, and then I go against the devil. If the devil is attacking me in the area of my health, well, I got to find what the word says concerning healing, right? And I got to say, by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. Amen. He blessed the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Benefits, pardons all my iniquities, healeth all my diseases. Okay, I'm speaking the word, but as I speak the word, I need to follow it with some tongues. By the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. No weapon form against me. The Lord Jehovah is Jehovah Rapha, my healer. I will live and not die. With long life. God and it's going to satisfy me. That's when the violent begin to take their possession by force. Now, you don't have to yell, but you do need to have to pray with, 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 um, with what? Vigor. It doesn't have to be loud, but it has to be. Do you understand? We're talking about spiritual warfare. Say spiritual warfare is real. And God has given us weapons, but we got to use them, right? You can't just not use your weapons. So be diligent to put on the armor. And I told you how to do that. You renew your mind with the knowledge of the truth concerning these things. And then go on the offense. Take the word of God that you put in your mind and your heart and, and start to speak it out of your mouth. Combine that with prayer. Pray in English, but also pray in the Holy Ghost. If you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues, pray in tongues. If you're not baptized with the Holy Spirit yet, there's no reason why you can't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and add to your prayer life, your prayer language. It'll just make you even more effective in dealing with the devil. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, to tell you the two guys, I got to say, I, I, I can't continue, but I've said enough for the day. Oh, you sad? The meeting, the meeting doesn't start until 1.30, right? 1.40? Yeah. Huh? Okay. I think I think I got enough time to finish it. Okay, because I want to show you the practical application of this. It's important. I don't, I mean, this is real. This is life. Somebody's life depends upon this, okay? And, and, and you know, I, 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 yeah, so, so let's go to Joshua chapter, chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. This should, should, I, should, I should be finished by 115. Joshua chapter 6. Are you, are you here? All right. Now, God, remember God had delivered Israel out of what? Egypt. Broke Pharaoh's back completely. And what was it that he used to bring an end to Satan's authority? It was blood. 
when the lambs were killed, the sacrificial lambs, and put on the doorposts, that night was when all of Pharaoh's resistance came to an end. And the very next day, he was glad for Israel to leave. So by the power of the sacrificial blood, which is a type of Jesus, the power of the kingdom of darkness represented by Pharaoh came to a complete end. Israel walked out free. That is a type of your salvation. Amen. By the power of the blood of Jesus, Christ has spoiled principalities and powers, and the authority of Satan over your life and over you has come to an end. Just like Israel was free from Pharaoh that night when the blood was shed, so all of us have been set free from the devil's authority and power because Jesus shed his blood. Satan has absolutely no more authority and power over you than Pharaoh had over Israel when they walked out of Egypt. When you got saved, you walked out of Egypt. You're no longer under the control and dominion of Satan. Don't believe the lie. Don't believe the lie. Don't let him lie to you and say he still has authority over you. He still has power over you. He doesn't. Say, devil, I know the truth. And the truth is, when Jesus shed his blood, your dominion, your authority, your power over me came to an end, and I am free. All right? Israel was delivered out of the kingdom of darkness. You have been delivered. Your spirit is free, sealed in Jesus. Thank God. But God did not just bring Israel out of Egypt. He intended to bring them into the promised land. And the scripture describes the promised land as a land that's overflowing with milk and honey. Equally so, God's purpose was not just to bring you out of sin and out of judgment. God's intention is for you to experience in this life all things that pertain to life and godliness. God wants you to experience the abundant life. God wants you to walk in righteousness, walk in peace, walk in the joy of the Holy Spirit while here on earth. He wants you to be victorious. God wants you to experience his love as he supplies all of your needs. God wants you to fulfill your purpose and your destiny. In spite of the opposition, God wants you to do what he's called you to do and be glorified in that. You hear me? So he brought you out to bring you in. Israel left Egypt, and then they wandered in the wilderness because of unbelief. God doesn't want you wandering in the wilderness because of unbelief. Now that you are brought out, he wants you to take possession of your inheritance. Are you hearing me? So Israel came out, and then in Joshua chapter 6, you know, Moses had just died. In Joshua 1, Moses had died, and God spoke to Joshua. And God said, now get up and take them into the promised land. All right? It's time now for them to possess their inheritance. Now, what we're going to see here is that they had to deal with strongholds in order to enter in. And we see that clearly illustrated in chapter 6 of Joshua, verse 2. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have what? Given you Jericho into your hand, its king, and what? Okay, wait a minute. Joshua and Israel are standing out. Jericho is a city that God has given to them. It's their inheritance. It's their possession, right? And the first thing God says to Joshua is, as you now are about to enter in to take possession of what is yours, I want you to see that I have given you Jericho. Hear me. Here's the application. In tearing down strongholds, mental or spiritual, whatever the stronghold are, strongholds might be, that are there to prevent you from possessing your possession, the very first thing you need to do is to see that the Lord has already given you the thing that the enemy is trying to keep from you. Amen. I don't know what your Jericho is, but whatever your Jericho is, the place to start in taking possession of your possession is to know that God has already given you that thing in Christ. Amen. There's no question about it. So, so see, before you even go in, Joshua, I want you to look at the walls. I want you to see the king. I want you to see the mighty men of valor. They're all there, but that makes no difference. I have given this to you, and you need to see it. So you begin by becoming convinced that the thing that you desire, that the enemy is trying to hold on to, belongs to you. God has already given it to you in Christ. It's yours. Therefore, the king and his mighty men of valor cannot keep it 
from you cannot prevent you from possessing it because the thing they're trying to hold on to is something God has given you to, you have a right to. So if it's healing, you begin by establishing, becoming convinced that look, healing is my inheritance. Healing is my birthright. Healing has already been provided for me in Christ. Jesus has already died for it. Healing is already mine. I already possess it. It's mine in Christ. And devil, you can't stop it from manifesting. You can't keep me from enjoying it because it's already mine. You got to begin with believing and knowing what is already given to you in Christ. All right? Raise your hand and say, I see. This healing, God has already given it to me. This miracle already belongs to me. In Christ, it's already my possession. I already have the title deed to it. My name is already on the deed. This is something Jesus already died for. This is something Jesus already shed his blood for. This is something Jesus already purchased and it's mine and it's mine now. So if you're not sure, then you need to spend some time seeing until you become sure it's yours. Then, then move on, verse 3. Then he begins to give him instructions. And we need to understand now, because these instructions will help us understand what we need to do to bring down the strongholds and take position on our position. He says, you shall march around the city, all you men of war, you shall go around the city once. This shall you do for six days. Now, later on in this chapter, we're going to read it. He tells them, while you're going around the city, don't say a word. Next, verse 4. And seven priests shall bear what? Seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark. But the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the horn. Now, listen to me. I want you to watch this. So, God is saying, take, possess Jericho. But the city was strictly shut up. That's what verse 1 says. There was a wall built around Jericho. The inhabitants in Jericho didn't want to give up Jericho easily. So Israel had to take it. The devil, the world, and the flesh will not want to just surrender. So you got to take what's yours. All right? In order to take what you are, you got to begin by seeing that you have a right to it. Christ has already given it to you. And then look at the instructions. For six days, walk around. Priest, blow your horn. Carry the ark. Say nothing. Do it for six days. I don't know how many hours it took, but I would imagine a few hours. Then on day seventh, do it seven times. I'm getting dizzy already. <laughs> and the whole while, I, I, I am getting dizzy. Why are you, why are you, uh, why, let me stay back here a little bit. <laughs> and while you're doing this, be quiet. Don't say a word. On day seven, do it seven times. Don't say a word. That seems strange. There's a stronghold. There's a king and men of valor. We're going to take possession of it. And God says, march around the city. Let the, let the priest blow the trumpet. And then you carry the ark. But don't say anything. Why? Let me suggest to you two reasons why you should be quiet. Why did God say, don't let them say anything? Because I guarantee you, there were some confusionists. There were some doubters. There were some complainers in that group who felt Joshua didn't know what he was doing. This made absolutely no sense. What kind of battle plan is this? This young boy doesn't know what he's doing. I wish Moses was here. Because if Moses was here, he would not have told us to do something so silly. There were people who were about to complain and doubt. And the problem is, if you allow them to talk, they were going to spread it. And maybe only, maybe only 1% of them was feeling that way, but if they start talking, by the time they got through, there will be maybe 25%, 30% of the people thinking that way. So God says, so make sure that we don't spread doubt and unbelief and division. Y'all just be quiet for a while. Okay, sometimes you need to be quiet. Until you can believe God, it's probably good to shut your mouth. 
It's true. I'm talking just in your personal life. Because God may be telling you to do things that make no sense and you don't quite understand it yet. Just be quiet because if you open your mouth, you will spoil it. There are many of us who have missed our blessings because we talk too soon. We talk before we were ready to speak. And so what we said was not in agreement with what God has said. And we just delayed our blessings. You somebody should have given me an offering just for that. <laughs> All right. So don't say anything because really right now you're not ready to speak. Just walk around the city. But really, it's more than that. While they're walking around and saying nothing, what else is happening? The ark of the Lord's presence is lifted up. The priests are in front and they're blowing on the horns of the ram. You need to understand. The ark is a type of Jesus Christ and the covenant. The ark represents the presence of God with Israel. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. So the ark is the presence of Jesus in their midst. The ark represents the covenant that existed between God and his people and the promises which God had made in Abraham to bless them with his property. The horns, those seven horns, ram's horn, were a particular type of horn. This horn was blown to announce the year of Jubilee. Now, if you know anything about Jubilee, Jubilee was a period in Israel when all sins, all debts were canceled. All prisoners were set free. Are you hearing me? All people were delivered from every type of bondage and everybody got to start afresh. In other words, whenever they blew the ram's horn, Israel was hearing the sound of Jubilee. In other words, on the horn, they were proclaiming the good news of salvation, of deliverance, of redemption, of freedom, of the end of all bondage, of a new beginning, of victory. So now watch this because this is how it applies to us. What they were doing for seven days while they were saying nothing was that they were focusing their eyes on Jesus, the covenant, and the finished work. And they were hearing over and over the gospel of peace, the gospel of salvation. They were hearing the gospel, liberation, freedom, forgiveness, cancellation of debt, all bondages broken. They were hearing the sounds of victory. They were hearing the gospel with their ears and they were seeing, beholding Christ and the finished work, the covenant that was made in him. And for seven days they had set aside, God had made them set aside by force, hours to do nothing else because they were walking, they're not home, they're not cooking. They're not in the, at the farm. They're not going to business. They're not reading any book. You didn't hear me. If they're not conversing among themselves, they're forced to be listening. So God had forced them to get alone, to set aside time when they did nothing but meditate on the covenant. And they did nothing but kept hearing the gospel. For hours, they were beholding Jesus and hearing the word of grace. Hearing the good news being proclaimed by the trumpet. Six days to set aside blocks of time. On the seventh day, God says set aside even more time. And after saturating their minds. How many of you know, when you keep looking at the same thing over and over again, and you keep hearing the same thing over and over again, eventually what you're seeing and hearing will get inside of you? And will start to change the way you think and the way you feel? What God was doing was renewing their minds. Amen? By having them focus. And for us... This is the lesson. The way we renew our minds is by setting aside quality time. You don't always have to be talking to your friend and you stop talking for a while. Put 
go you get a, get away from the distractions on a daily basis get alone and all you want to do when you get alone is allow the Holy Spirit to focus your mind on Jesus and on the covenant and on what he's accomplished for you by the blood amen and set aside time daily to keep hearing to keep hearing the gospel of peace don't just hear anything hear the gospel the good news of what God has done for us in Christ and if we keep hearing and keep hearing and keep beholding and keep beholding and keep hearing and keep hearing what we're beholding what we're hearing is going to enter our minds it's going to enter our hearts and the stronghold of doubt and the stronghold of unbelief will begin to fall will begin to collapse and the time will come when now that we're so full of the revelation of Jesus and so full of the revelation of the blood and so full of the revelation of the gospel of peace that when we open our mouth and we shout on day seven the shout will be the shout of victory the shout will be the shout of faith the shout will be the shout of triumph and the Bible says when they shouted on day seven the stronghold came tumbling down and Israel entered into Jericho and they possessed their possessions in the name of Jesus even so I prophesy that as you behold Jesus as you set aside time to meditate on to focus on to set your mind on Jesus and his blood and Jesus and his covenant and as you make it your business to continually on a daily basis hear the sound of jubilee hear the sound of deliverance hear the sound of the cancellation of all debt hear the sounds of the gift of righteousness hear the sounds of victory the walls of the enemy has erected in your mind will collapse before you and like Israel you will be able to step in and possess your Jericho whatever your Jericho may be it doesn't matter that the king is there it doesn't matter that the men of valor are there they cannot withstand the power of God that is at work in you and that is released when the strongholds come down in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, may the Lord open your eyes and open my eyes and like never before give me and you a fresh revelation of what Christ has done for us so that we may enter into and take possession of the promises of God. Israel had a promised land. We have a land of promises. And all the promises of God in Christ, there's only one answer is yes. Only one answer, yes. And our response is amen. 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 I'm blessed, amen. I'm healed, amen. I'm going to prosper, amen. I'm somewhere. I'm going, I'm some, somebody going somewhere to manifest. Amen. God's purpose in my life is being fulfilled, amen. No weapon form against me will prosper. Amen, 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 amen. In this world, I will have tribulation. But I know that in all these things, I'm more than a conqueror. Amen. Amen. God will always cause me to be victorious. He will always cause me to triumph in Christ. Amen. 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 To God be the glory. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, Lord, I ask now that the power of the Holy Spirit will be manifested. I ask now that the strongholds in our minds and the lives of your people, mental, emotional, financial strongholds will be broken now by the very anointing as we shout Jesus. I want you to shout Jesus seven times. And as you shout the name of Jesus, let's believe that strongholds are coming down. One, two, Jesus! Jesus!